I'm invincible. I'm paying money. Uh, the girl's happy. She's got no money. I got my rocks off. Oh, how good is this? <laughs> Good morning, and you'll listen to Bound for Glory, Sin's only football show. My name's Ben Kazupi. Just introduce the panel quickly. Uh, Matt Joyce, Jordan Keneal, Ethan Meldrum, and Peter Williams. We have a big show today. We have a lot of football to talk about. We will not only cover the games so far this weekend, we will preview the rest of them, the rest of the round, and we'll also discuss a few side topics, uh, a few interesting things. The Melbourne Football Club is obviously looking to get itself out of a hole. There are many ways that they can choose to do this. We'll discuss, you know, what which may or may not work. We'll also discuss the coaches at the moment. Um, you know, uh, the way they're travelling. The, I believe the Herald Sun this week took a look at who's under the most pressure and, and we'll evaluate that and see how everything's going. I think we'll start off last night. Speaking let's, let's of the fast start shambles, let's start there. <laughs> the fast shambles that it was. Yeah. Um, to start on a coach... Brad Scott. Um, save it for the segment. <laughs> save it for the segment. Should we... Oh, well, just okay, go over okay, okay, the players. Go over the I'll, players. I'll go through the, okay, I'll go through... Last night, the Gold Coast Suns were fantastic against North Melbourne. They adapted better credit to Guy McKenna, who, who coached a side that looked incredibly inept in that first quarter. And after that, they, they were brilliant. They, their forward press was immense. And, and just as, as much as the Gold Coast were good, North Melbourne were horrendous. That was one of the worst games I've seen North Melbourne play for a very long time. And um, this year, that's saying something. Yeah, that is. They've actually played pretty well, despite the results mm. and some of the mental compi- uh, capitulations. Uh, they've, they've actually done okay. And I didn't expect them to make finals. Mm. I, I had them outside my eight. Mm. But last night was... That I'm, was completely I'm honestly not sure I've seen a worse three quarters overall of footy this year from North. Yeah. Or from anyone. That was... Yeah, that's... That's pretty much borderline. No, that's that was borderline Melbourne. That's uh, I can't disagree with that. That's completely. And I think I just want to run through some some stats. I blame Eth because now I'm addicted to stats. And <laughs> Scotty Barbie, he's probably asleep. But yeah, okay. Not, not there's anything wrong with that. Not there's anything wrong with that because they, they they tell a story. Scores from stoppages after quarter time: the Gold Coast Suns forty three, North Melbourne seven. Clearances from stoppages, Gold Coast 43, North Melbourne 33. Contested disposals, the Suns had 30 more. Inside 50s, 24 more to the Suns. They had 56 to something like 30 after quarter time. Mm. Now some individual North Melbourne players who don't cop heat, and they haven't coped heat yet because obviously they're a young side and people like to wait and people like to evaluate And this ain't pretty either. No, this is not. This is actually... This is almost 186, going through the Melbourne <laughs> stats from 186. Again, the Melbourne comparisons, because that's what those Lockie last three quarters were. Brett Maloney. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, Jamie McMillan. Game had 207 tackles. He had one tackle. 14 of his touches were clangers. Sorry, 14 of his, 8 of his 14 touches were clangers. I was going to say 14 touches were yeah, clangers. Well, that's <laughs> probably an all-time yeah. record. <laughs> yeah. 93% time on ground for Michael Ferrito, a defender. Uh, the Suns had something like 200 of their 350 disposals in their half of the ground. You'd think Michael Ferrito would lay a few tackles. Again, a game, 207 tackles. He laid one. Lee Adams had 11 touches, 80-odd percent time on ground, ran at 27% disposal efficiency. Now, when a game in regular con- uh, conditions... About 70% is okay. Above that's 70 probably, is, That's probably about league average. That's league average. And then when it rains, you'd say 55, 60. 27. What the... F- 27. <laughs> can, can someone explain five, how... Five of those were in the first quarter as well. Yeah. So he, he couldn't get near it after quarter time. Uh, Ryan Bastinac, you know, he had six in the first, five for the rest of the game. He was Lindsay, really quiet, yeah. Yeah, Lindsay Thomas, seven and two. Uh, and Ferrito, again, the game was in the back half and he only had seven disposals. Mm. Of his 12 and that 
last last three quarters. And for people that hate flopping, Lindsay Thomas, oh, <laughs> you, you monster! Like, you you can't be doing that and expect to have the respect of the football community. I'm sure the coach will come out and say, "Oh, it doesn't matter what the football community thinks as long as he kicks goals." Blah blah blah. But it's a bad image, um, and not one it's that a bad you want. image. But it's not something that no you want associated with your club. Well, the AFL hey, should. They should. Well, they're not because that's work. Mm. And you know, that would make them go back on because they've protected every part of the body. And if you protect every part of that part of the body, and then yeah, it makes it so easy to play for a free kick. Imagine mm. try, trying to play for a free kick 15, 20 years ago. You couldn't do that. You can do that now because everything's protected. On that note, how about that McMahon free kick? Like, yeah, I can was, someone explain that? I was about to um, say, like, the, the umpiring this since like a few rounds ago maybe like a month ago it's been fantastic in my opinion there's been about a 40% drop in free kicks so there's a lot less you know tea touch wood sort of free kicks yep, being paid 29 last night which yeah. is, that's, that's pretty good that's normally just the North Melbourne free kick count uh, <laughs> so um, but I mean there were a couple in the you know the Essendon Carlton game as well but uh, the Scott McMahon free kick should not have been there um, he was diving hands like his hands yeah. brushed his shoelaces maybe <laughs> and he th- it was paid uh, contact below the knees as a free yeah. kick and that's just not on it's a, basically a smother that he was doing mm. so it's that, that is a perfect en- encapsulation of why the sliding rule is going to fail during wet weather and mm. why it's just a ridiculous idea in the first place yeah. just to note there's been 104 free kicks this round so far which is 26 a game yeah, that's probably about what. <laughs> it's very good. It's, it's where you want to be. It dropped from like I think per round it was four hundred and something, and it dropped to like mid two hundreds, uh, like as an average ever since. Uh, is it Mark Evans came in for the um, yeah into the AFL? So. Yeah, so big difference. Great job. Hopefully, Geeshin mm. keeps his nose out of it. Hopefully, also one more North Melbourne player. I just want to belt while well, we've got time. <laughs> Have a swing, girl. Lachlan Hansen. 62% time on ground was subbed out in that third quarter, I believe. One kick. One kick. In defence. The ball was in the sun's half of the ground for a good 60% of the game. He got one kick. Not a hand pass. Didn't get a hand pass. I'm not sure how many tackles he got. I'm sure he didn't get many. Uh, just looking down the statue. Uh, I can't find many. it right now. But no, he probably not many. <laughs> He's <laughs> blind with rage. I'm blind with rage. I can't read a sheet that's about that. 30 centimetres in front of me. That's yeah, staggering. Joyce will find it. I'm mean, really, really staggering. Like, you think, how many people, you reckon, from the crowd could probably go into that North Melbourne back line and pick up several tackles and a couple of kicks? Like, yeah. <laughs> even Three tackles? You got three tackles. Even to just go at 100%. I mean, even Andrew Swallow couldn't get into the game last night. And that, that's. <laughs> The first time I can say that in years. Mm. He had 10 disposals last night. I mean, he had 12 or 13 tackles, I believe. So, you know, he was trying his guts out, but he couldn't get near the footy. And, it, you know, you're never going to win a game of footy when probably half your team it really isn't going at 60 70% even. I just, like, sorry, Heath, I just want to uh, address a um, message we sent. Please text your thoughts in to us about North Melbourne's performance or your own team's performance on 0427 767 767. We have a... Not sure you haven't left your name, but uh, yeah, please. Storm, storm. Oh, sorry, Stornside. No, no, Damo, not the second one. Oh, no, no, that's yeah. from someone else. Brad Scott. I'll just read this out from anonymous. Brad Scott's progress with North Melbourne has been good, though many are quick to blame his game day coaching. The side uh, unable to run out games, much like a development or expansion squad. Gold Coast, on the other hand, they seem likely to play finals next year. I'd say to that that I'd say Brad Scott. He's not reactive enough. He's too stubborn. That's <laughs> North Melbourne have gone to Utah the last three years in a row. I've seen very minimal improvement in that area. I'd consider scrapping it this year if, if I were North Melbourne. But, yeah, I, I have to disagree with that. I, I, Brad Scott, coaching on game day leaves a lot to be decided. I think we're quick to judge what Brad Scott does on game day. On, sorry, on game day, but it doesn't mean we're incorrect. Mm-hmm. No. I mean... Uh, Trent McKenzie and, to a lesser extent, Sam Day were playing on no one behind the ball last night, waiting for a north, you know, rush kick out of a pack. And Trent McKenzie had 25 disposals, and he was all over on the halfback. Gary Ablett, you know, he had, he had you know, he, his normal sort of game. He had 33 disposals. <coughs> I mean, didn't take a mark, but he was everywhere. 
and no one was on him. You know, in the last quarter, you think, okay, we got to stop Gold Coast Run. We got to put, you got to put someone on Ablett. You know, you got to at least quell his influence. Hope he can get maybe seven or eight disposals at maybe fifty percent efficiency or something, and lessen his impact. And he had two clearances in that last quarter that probably sealed the game. Yeah, almost. and I think this is the mindset that Brad Scott has. He put Daniel Wells on him, an offensive footballer. Now Daniel Wells isn't. Well, he, his assets are offensive; they're not defensive. Taylor Hine was in the squad. He can play as a tagger. Um, Will Serikowski can play in that defensive role. Ryan Bastonak's been trialled. He's done okay. But th- there was no attempt to quell what the Gold Coast were doing. And even when you look at two Gold Coast players, Tom Nichols and Rory Thompson, they played in the back line mostly. Tom Nichols? No, Tom Nichols in the ruck. ruck yeah. In the ruck, yeah, sorry. Yeah, but it was bad. relief. It was relief. Yeah, relief. He, he'd, he'd step back behind the play for, for that yeah. long kick. They were just doing that all night, and they st- those two still got 10 tackles. They managed to push up, and they managed to compact North Melbourne so much, and, and they squeezed them. It was Sydney-like. <laughs> I mean, who really... I mean, looking at last night's game, who really can hold their head up for North Melbourne? I mean, you look through the stat sheet, you look at last night's game... and Cunnington, that's it. Ben, oh, Ben Cunnington had a fantastic game. I mean, he's, had, he's a brilliant year. Mm. Yet, I mean, mm. and you, look, you look at the stats from uh, quarter time and there is it's not pretty I mean Cunnington had 19 disposals so I think he led the way for those last three quarters and you know five clearances 12 tackles he was fantastic I think Nathan Grimer was another good one you know he had 19 one percenters I think that's probably bordering on all-time records you know he was getting I mean it's difficult to take a mark in Gold Coast forward line of course but you know he was getting his hands on everything and spoiling everything and just making sure he could do as much as he could uh, I thought Sam Gibson was okay as well you know He's normally an outside player. He got his hands dirty, and he he played well. And I thought Wells was okay, but there really there really isn't much. I've got uh, someone I want to rip into. I think he's flown right under the radar. And he's not a North player. David Swallow, number one pick. I think he's been for the most part of his career very disappointing. I think he's had a lot of those. Oh, he's had injury problems. He has, but he's had those twenty odd possession games. But he hasn't really. I don't think he's really made the opposition pay, whereas you see with Jaeger O'Meara, he's like made such an impact already. Mm-hmm. Whereas Dave he's, Swallow, he's just, taken Swallow, he has, yeah, by far. I think so has Benel. Yeah, and I think even the uh, the lesser likes in uh, Human Meeple and and so on. I think <laughs> Swallow is just he's like Luke gone, Russell is even taken. Over yeah, Luke Swallow. Russell. Yeah, I, I just I don't know. I think that if there's someone that should be p- potentially up for trade if they want to bring in some sort of established Ooh. star then I think Dave Swallow could be one to go. He's been moved to the half-back flank because he couldn't get mm. his hands on it, or he, if he did, he <coughs> butchered it through the midfield. So it's, it's tough to see what you want to do with him. I mean, could he come to North Melbourne and fix him? I was just about to say that. Yeah. You hear that the, the brothers have done interviews before, and you know they say they mention they want to play with each other. Yeah, hopefully Andrew Swallow doesn't leave, <laughs> because then uh, I'd probably be reduced to a blubbering mess. There you go. Found your trade for Jack Siebel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're getting a lot of texts saying, you know, what can Adam Simpson do as coach of North Melbourne? Well, is it uh, Hawthorne now, is that right? He is an assistant at Hawthorne. I believe he's either in his last year or his second last year of his contract there as, as an assistant. And him and James Brayshaw, are, are either they're friends or they're you know, business together, I don't know, and I'm not going to speculate, but they've they've met a few times. And if... And I'm not going to say Brad Scott's in danger of losing his job because he's just signed a, a four-year contract extension, oddly enough, which well, I thought was a bit... Uh, excessive. I thought, excessive, yes. Three years would have been the absolute maximum. May I would have thought two was better, but again, I don't run things at North Melbourne, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I would think if if there was a way out and if someone... Because I just don't see anyone in that box who's proactive enough. The only time I've seen North Melbourne play proactive football was against Geelong last year, Mm. where they had some sort of idea and they had some sort of genesis and some sort of way to approach the game and say, "Okay, we're here to win this. And and it was sort of, okay, when the game goes against North Melbourne, what happens? As we've had a mention, uh, Andrew Swallow, um, he usually stands up, where was he last night? Where was it, you know? Where are some of these other senior players? And you can only make the excuse that the list is young for so long. Well, the Swallow, the captain needs to stand by the coach's decision, so he can't, you know... Obviously, there was a directive not to have someone matching up on these guys that were behind the ball, um, like, you know, know, Trent McKenzie and that sort of thing. So he can't really go and say, you know, 
Lee Adams, you're having a crap game. Go <laughs> stand next to Trent McKenzie. Um, so there really needs to be solidarity between the captain and coach, and I'm guessing that's what Swallow did. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good state of affairs, and we're getting a lot of texts, actually. Yeah, so. from uh, Jeff Kennett, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hi, Jeff. Good to see you. Keep texting in, of course, on 0427767 or online at sin.org.au. Um, and some more texts um, talking about the roof, and can all stadiums have a roof? This is from Aiden, <laughs> the, uh, the Richmond heading flog. Um, <laughs> so basically he's saying, you know, can, can they all be issued with floaties so we don't drown? Well... Here's the situation. In finals at the MCG, there's not a roof. So deal with it. You're no, gonna, no, 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 no. You're this, this, is, this is the issue already. Like, th- we have to have the discussion that a professional AFL football team cannot handle conditions that are not perfect. Well, that's the thing. As if, like, as if it doesn't make any sense. As, why do we... Why is this even a discussion? It's that bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not indoor soccer or anything, guys. Yeah. Like, did you, did you go through your anything. whole junior career, like, playing in bloody... Somewhere it doesn't rain, like Dubai or something. If, like, <laughs> if, where, where have you come if from? If that doesn't speak volumes right. on the um, the lack of mental fortitude in that group and the lack of what I see as a plan B in Brad Scott's uh, coaching playbook, I don't I don't know what it is. But I think we should move on. There was another yeah. game on Friday night. Just one, one last thing. One word to sum up Brad Scott. Flawed. Speaking of flawed, Jake Melksham was... <laughs> That is a brilliant segue. I don't think you've done a better one. <laughs> I, I really did set that up. <laughs> Speaking of what, uh, Jake Melksham was the winner in the uh, the Essendon Carlton game on it's been Friday a while night. Since we could say that. I know my friend, uh, best mate, actually made Jake Melksham his background on his phone. He said at halftime, "If Melksham is the difference in this game, <laughs> I am keeping this for a year," and he did. So, you look, you, on look, him. you look through the Essendon squad, you see Joe Watson, Brendan Goddard. I, I don't know. Uh, Brent Stanton, someone like that. Oh, let's pick Jake Melchon to win this game off his own boot. <laughs> Three goals. <laughs> Three goals. Very and, good. Uh, they were all in the second half, weren't they? Mm. And, you know, it's, One he, was a gimme, but... Yeah. Well, nonetheless, he still kicked three goals. Mm. And, you know, he, he's had his criticisms this year. You know, he's been dropped. He's gone back to the VFL. He's, he's tried to work <laughs> on his game. We know he's a top draft pick. He really hasn't hit his stride as much. And... Mm. He's kicked three goals in the second half. He's won a very tight game, a very important game over Carlton, who were sixth at the time. I think they still are. Mm. Not, not and his defensive shot. efforts were a lot better as well, that def- I noticed. Yeah, his defensive efforts were a lot better as well. And, you know, it was a very much improved game from him and hopefully one that keeps him aside for the rest of the year. I think in the games that he has stepped up, obviously not many this year besides uh, the game on Friday night, but a few years back against uh, Geelong where no one expected the Bombers to win, uh, Melksham had something like 28 touches, a few goals, and he was really the game winner. So he's got that, I guess, clutch factor about him, but he's way too inconsistent and he's uh, not a great ball user. So, look, I, I, look, <clears throat> I just... Give me a second to have a little rant about the about the Blues fans... Okay, whoa, okay. Whoa, 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 we don't just, want to insult. We, we, we love all supporters on this show. Just Okay, you can, do, go okay, okay you can go okay. now. First <laughs> off, okay, Garlet should have been a goal, but that would have put you as a draw, not a win. And then down the other end, I think uh, Walker got away with an absolute... Uh, I think that was a howler, the non-call on Stanton, the... Um, over the shoulder, yeah, and then that was ridiculous. the the weight mark that was potentially over the line. I think that uh, that even dealt with the Joe Danaher uh, potential push in the back or whatever. So, mm-hmm. I think in fairness, I don't think the umpires robbed you of anything. If anything, um, you they, know, I they, think it was well played. Well they robbed. Th- they robbed themselves. Carlton. Yeah, absolutely. They had. Th- they lost it in the last quarter. Yeah. Yeah. They had four more disposals, which isn't much, but to for sense. argument's sake, com- <laughs> let me build this up. They had five more clearances. Wait, sorry, when was this? Uh, Friday night. Sorry? Oh, no, no, in the game. In the game. Okay. In the in game in general. From the centre, they won 12-5, so they won seven clearances. They had nine more inside 50s. They took three more marks inside 50s. They had 14 more tackles, which means they were switched on and they you know, pressured when it counted, and then had 10 more contested possessions. That wasn't a low-tackle game as well. Yeah, it wasn't. And if you lose... Th- th- these are basic key, you can lose all co- kinds of things and you can still lose the game but when you win most of these key indicators and you still lose that shows that you fell asleep at the wrong time and that was it was almost a North Melbourne like performance, that's yeah. what you kind of liken it to because it was just that mental drop off and Essendon took 
perfect advantage of it. And again, it was that 20 or so minutes of football that Carlton's done this all year. That, yep. You know, they've been good for 100 <laughs> minutes of the game. They've been really solid and they've probably been in front. Like, they were, they were in front on Friday night. And then they drop off. They, you know, they just lose it. They don't play as well as they can. You know, you know Essen had 16 more effective kicks in that last quarter, and that, that's a lot for a quarter. You know, averages about 30 per quarter. So... You know, they just weren't switched on and you know, they switched off at the wrong time and Essendon capitalised. They kicked five goals to two in that last quarter and sealed the game and it's just really not good to see from Carlton if they're gonna be a finals team that they're gonna switch off at really important moments in clutch games. And it was interesting to note there were only sixteen free kicks, um, or seventeen free kicks all game. So um an average of around thirty for the rest of the games, um, this round. So that's that's an interesting like seven and nine or whatever it was. That's uh Oh it that's was it was good. The umpires put the mm. whistle away and you know, there's, there were probably some frees that, you know, other games this round you would have paid, but you know, letting the players play I think is all you can do, especially in what was a tight game in that last quarter. And just speaking of Carlton in general, if you can't win the game, if you completely shut out Stanton, Hibbard, and Watson, and wait to kick seven just goals on that, Ed Kerner did a fantastic job on Brent Stanton. I he think did. we have to give credit. To yeah, him that. definitely. But if you can't win after all those things go your way, there's there's something fundamentally wrong with the team. The moment Judd won that ball out of the centre and he ran forward and kicked that point, you just thought, oh well, you know, it's game. Let's all just go home or change the channel. And then it just turned. Like <laughs> it just turned. Essendon got a goal against the run, and then Carlton went. Oh well, you know, they didn't do anything about. Let's it. let them kick five more. <laughs> <laughs> what you were saying before, Ben, about reactive coaching? How I guess Brad Scott doesn't do enough of that. I think the the game winning change was probably putting Carlisle up forward and Hurley down back. Um, and I think Carlisle was he was getting tailed up by uh, Waite and Hooker went to him, no difference. And then Hurley went back to him and Carlisle went up forward and that's a, that's they a, had no answers for him. He's a key position player, had 23 disposals, 13 marks. He probably was... Well, kicked a goal. And, yeah. and kick, kicked an important goal as well. And, you know, Waite was obviously the best player on the ground. I think he was ominous and, uh, you know, he took, I don't know, 20,000 marks inside 50 and kicked seven goals out of Carlton's 10 and he was fantastic. But Carlisle was a very close second to him. He, he played fantastic. I think, quickly before we go to a break, Yaron, was it the right decision to make him the sub? No. no, no. Not at all. No. Okay. Cal- um, sorry, not Carlton. Essen don't have, you know, their small defenders probably aren't as good a quality as, you know, probably the rest of the league. Players like Bagley and Hibbert, you know, they're, they're good players, but, you know, they're not quick. And you have Betts, Garlett and Yaron who get enough of the footy and running around in the forward half. They're going to do some serious damage. They have in the past, and, you know, you take Yaron out of that and all of a sudden the impact is a lot less. On that last note, the fact that people are now choosing players they think can impact the game rather than, say, the 22nd man, because it, it yep. started off being the 22nd man, whoever was, say, the last pick, say, a debutant, something like that. Now coaches are starting to pick someone who they believe that, hey, if we're down or we're only just up, we need something to change the game, we've got someone who can do that. And I think that was the yep. reason. Spot on, Pete. And I think on that note, we should go to some sin messages. Remember, text us in your thoughts on all things football 0427 767 767. We'll be right back after this. Not listening to objection is criminal. Does the brain generate as much power as either a 10 watt or a 20 watt light bulb? 10 watt or 20 watt? Mm-hmm. Um, let's go uh, 20 watt. Mm-hmm. All right. No, it's 10 damn watt. it. It's 10, 10 watts. Watt. Damn it. How did they measure that? Was it like luminosity or something? Oh, I'm not sure. I just body, you know, humanbody.net tells me these things. So <laughs> I'm checked. Um, I'm not a scientist, you know. I have other things that I do. Um, <laughs> Objection. Five to six weekdays. 8 a.m. Weekends. A side quest is an optional section of a video game and is commonly found in role-playing games. It is a smaller mission within a larger storyline and can be used as a means to provide non-linear structures to an otherwise linear plot. As a general rule, the completion of side quests are not essential for the game to be finished, but can bring various benefits to the player characters. Also non-essential but highly awesome is side quests and sin. So tune in Fridays at 11pm to hear side quest, sin's home of indie and retro gaming. This is another Sports Desk host profile. Y'all ready for this? Tuesday. Name? Sam. Favourite sports? Love me footy. (laughs) Favourite sporting team? The Essendon Bombers. And the Chicago Bulls. Favourite sporting memory? David Zaharakis' winning goal in the 2009 Anzac Day. 
What's going to be the biggest story in sports come the end of the year? Whether Derek Rose is playing or not. Will he play? No. Makes me sad. You can catch the Sports Desk daily from 9am on Neon Sin. Here on Bound for Glory, text us in on 0427-767-767. We're going to be having a look at the Swans and Crows game and then following that uh, Cats and GWS. So we'll start off with Swans and Crows, what looked to be a pretty good battle, but uh, it ended up being just the Swans absolutely dominating. I think that came down a lot of it due to their defensive pressure. Um, Tom Mitchell, outstanding. Dan Hanbury, outstanding. Kieran Jack, outstanding. And uh, the stats man's on the edge of his seat. Uh, what have you got for us, Ethan? <laughs> Well, um, in that first quarter, I think Adelaide, you know, they had a lot of the footy. Uh, they were getting in inside 50 enough, and they took one mark inside 50. Uh, Sydney, in that in that first quarter, you know, that, that it's a slinger shot that we, you know, people talk about, and they had 11 inside 50s for six marks. And Adelaide's defence were like, well, what do, what do we do? You know, you know, they were completely outplayed. You know, players like even Jesse White in the Jesse White Cup, you know, standing up, and he he actually play, he he came into the side, he played well, and. You know, Adelaide, they had no penetration, so 50, and I think, you know, Sydney's defence was absolutely outstanding and, you know, rebounding and capitalising on, you know, probably any slightly ineffective kick. And Adelaide just lost all confidence, I thought, in the second quarter, and Sydney just annihilated them. They had, Sydney had 35 more disposals, 28 more effective, uh, seven less clangers with a lot less of the footy, 11 more marks, six more marks inside 50, 19 more inside 50s. And three more tackles, and they kicked six goals, six goals to two. So it was an absolute right, you know, Sydney running in ways. I think they've been in good form, but I think it's the first time this year that they've looked, you know, like absolute world beaters. You know, I don't think any team in the league could have beaten them yesterday the way they were playing in that second quarter or the third quarter. They were absolutely brilliant. And Tom Mitchell, he's just... <laughs> Taking the piss, aren't they? Yeah. They've got what that the that brilliant midfield which spreads well defensively. They pressure well and they use the ball pretty good. And then you just throw this kid in that can run around oh, for, no, yeah, for about touches, second game. You know, half okay, the okay, game. Just, just quite casually, here's this 20 year old who's going to have 30 disposals and 10 tackles with 70 percent time on ground. You know, just just, just, just whatever. Just he has to play fantasy football because he was just. Getting in the right spots to get the you cheap. Think that's marks. what he says to himself. <laughs> if I was I've playing, made myself captain. I've made myself. <laughs> if, if I was playing and I saw that they were chipping the ball around the back line, I would bolt down <laughs> to the back line and just get like you know cheap. Yeah, but you points. have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the scary thing about Sydney, I'm sure I've missed a couple of names, but they were missing Reese Shaw, Lewis Roberts, Thompson, Kurt Tippett, Sam Reed, and Lewis Jetta from that side. So and this also Marnie Matner yeah. and Alex Johnson as well. So that's Matner's done. Matner's though. retired. Yeah. Now, Matner's so. done, of course, but you know still injured. That's that's four members of their Premiership back six gone, mm. and and they've absolutely annihilated. You know, Josh Jenkins, who is actually you know he's in very good right, form yeah. this year, and Sean McKernan, you know he's okay. You know he's a second tall, and you know this lethal falls there. Dangerfield as well, who we know has had capabilities playing forward. He's kicked I don't know thirteen, fourteen goals this year, so. There are a lot of good players in that forward line, and Sydney were all over them, and it was fantastic to watch, and especially on the rebound. You know, Adelaide just didn't know what to do, and it's been a while since a team has been embarrassed on their home ground like that. And just reading a text from, that we got from Damo, it'll be very interesting to see what Tippett does when he comes in, um, whether it'll be a help or a hindrance. It's kind of like the, the Buddy Franklin scenario with Hawthorne, where there was a time when he was out for a stretch of games and they looked so much more impressive and there was a great spread of goals and when Buddy came back in, they were just kicking to him constantly and I'm not sure if Sydney's disciplined enough. We, obviously, they would be most likely to be disciplined enough to still keep the spread of goals and just go to tip it when he's available, but you, you, you'd really hate to see Sydney fall in a heap because tip... Well, actually, you'd love to see it because the way they got him, but... Uh, <laughs> well, it's dodgy. No, no, you're and, right. They it don't need cost of living and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it is pretty dodgy. Yeah. I think I think the way the tip of thing happens, the cost of living thing can be debated. I think I think that's another thing that we can discuss another time. But I think that it should be extended for some other teams too. Mm. But that, um, yep. But um, you know, I think with the tip of coming in thing, I think you know, I think Adam Goods, you know, he's not exclusively at all forward, but you know, he plays a lot in the forward line. I think that releases him a bit into the midfield as well. So. You know, you have Tippett and Reed playing tall forward. You know, Tippett goes up the ground, he relieves in the ruck a bit, and you know, then there's Mike Pike as well. It's almost a bit like what North Melbourne used to do with, uh, you know, Tarrant, uh, Petrie, and Hanson. You know, playing tall forwards, and you know, the second half of last year that worked well. That worked very well, and 
uh, teams find it hard to match up on if they haven't got three tall defenders in their back line. So, and you know they're going to get the ball enough. So, it I think that'll work well having those uh, three, three or four tall options even uh, up forward. I think on tall options. I mean, Sydney yesterday took 17 marks inside 50. They kicked uh, 12 goals from marks, and then nine of them were from that 30 to 50 range inside 50. So. You put any tall forward in with that sort of supply, they're probably going to come out better, especially a player like Kurt Tippett, who we know can take a fair few contested marks. It was a great game to watch from a football lover's point of view, just to see how great Sydney were. But the one consolation you have as the neutral fan, thank God Paul Roos was not commentating that game (laughs) because the commentary box would have overflowed with happy juice. Um, it's <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. Can we say that at 10 a.m. Happy Juice? Well, no, never mind. Never mind. Just, just say it. <laughs> You've anyway. said it now. No, no, no um, implications. No implications. Well, uh, good see. It's Mummy. impossible to have him commentate any more games. It's ridiculous. There should be something in his contract that says you cannot do this, because well, there was a, a thing last week where Essendon were playing Sydney, and they said. What, what should Essendon do if they come up against Sydney in finals? What are they going to do to try and beat them? And Paul Roo's response was, oh, how good has McVeigh been today? He has been so good. Malcheski in finals, he's going to come up the ground. He's going to have so much of an impact. No mention of Essendon. No, 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 the issue I have with it, it's, it's the same things. over. It. There's Goodsy, there's Mummy, there's Moneyball, there's Slingshot. I think they're the only four things he says consistently. Like... He's like you know those dolls with the the cords, and you pull them, and he say, they say the same thing. That's what it is. Maybe that's what, who it is. Maybe it's like it's just a repetitive like cassette or something. <laughs> like, Flip it over at half time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just the live com- broadcast. Please turn over. <laughs> it's an in commentary press read for Rude. <laughs> you press this button, you have every single quote that he's ever written. Oh, we need a soundboard for Rude. <laughs> we need a soundboard for Brian everything Taylor on the show. We've been saying it for eighteen months, but we haven't got off our ass. <laughs> to do it. Oh, but it was, it was a great game to watch. Oh, yeah, they were great. I think also you got Ryan O'Keefe, 15 tackles, <laughs> Tom Mitchell, 10 tackles. Ben McGlynn had more tackles than touches. He had mm. nine tackles and eight disposals. They were a f- freakish outfit, 85 and, tackles. And Dan Hanabry, of course, with 43 disposals. That was a ridiculous first half. He had 18 in that second quarter. And, no, you know, again, we talk about this with... Brad Scott earlier in the show and Brenton Sanderson, you know, he just had I, I don't think he knew what you know, he didn't really know what to do I suppose, you know, he said at half time, okay we're going to put Van Burlo on Ben Hanbury why didn't you do that after quarter time when he had 10 disposals, he had a lot of impact he goes on to have 18 more mm. and all of a sudden he's, you know, he's got the game he's got the ball on the string Yeah, oh, That's my favourite part of all that because <laughs> last week they played Fremantle a similar, a similar, and they got pretty well close. How do you go backwards? How do you go backwards playing a similar team last week, knowing you're going to play a side that plays a similar brand? Fremantle do rebound, not in the way Sydney do with that hard running, but they, they do find a way to rebound pretty well, and they set up really good defensively. How do you go backwards 80-odd points or whatever it is? Because <laughs> I, I don't think that there's that much of a difference between Sydney and Fremantle, because we saw Fremantle take it up to Sydney a couple of weeks ago. That's bizarre. I think the one thing that uh, struck me as uh, you know quite uh, surprising, I think, is you don't really see like Sydney really demolish teams like e- even against the lowly ranked teams. I think they've just I don't know how they've done it. They've uh, played so like high pressure football, so I guess like applying that defensive pressure, and then as a result of that, they just made so many like turnovers that they can score from. It's, that's crazy. Now let's let's move on to the the other game, which was also quite uh, quite interesting. Uh, Cats and GWS, and I think no one really predicted that what, what would happen in the first quarter. The um, Giants kicked the first five goals. Well, they did it last year. I think they kicked the first three, and then uh, Geelong were like, "Yeah, we shouldn't let this happen." And they yeah. went on a right from there. And you know, it's, it's really good to see GWS actually take it up to a top side like Geelong. You know, they're nine and eleven. You know, they got a percentage of about fifty, low fifty, something like that, and they. They haven't been, you know, overall that competitive against a lot of sides. You know, they've had losses against Hawthorne and West Coast and a lot of Adelaide as well, and they've been embarrassed by them. And, you know, they've, they've taken up to to Geelong, you know, another top team. You know, they've had a tough run the last few weeks, and they've actually taken up to Geelong. And, you know, the margin really does flatter 
uh, Geelong. Well, see, that's the frustrating thing. I think most of us, after seeing the Gold Coast game last week, knew what was going to happen. And you almost want GWS to get up just because if I was... Um, Chris, nearly got the wrong one. Chris Scott, um, I'd be saying anyone who isn't willing to chase and tackle against a bottom side shouldn't be playing next week against a top side oh, because yeah, that's, that's like they're getting away with it. That's that's the thing. If I was saying Chris Scott, three quarter time, if you're not willing to chase, not willing to tackle against, say, the Hawthorne, like against GWS and that, like you would against a Hawthorne or Sydney, then don't bother turning up next week because I wouldn't be naming you mm. because for that reason, because that's the whole thing. They, they've they got the attitude of, hey, they're, you know, bottom side, they're not going to do much, we, we can pretty much go about our business. And you're kind of hoping they were going to come unstuck, like that they play great football, but oh, just was kind of hoping they'd come a little unstuck just so it'd blow back in their face but they're too good they're yeah. too good Pete for North Melbourne coach basically yeah <laughs> what, what are you doing next year Pete <laughs> got any plans uh, long term <laughs> where do you see yourself uh, in five years <laughs> Pete, Pete this is Adam Simpson <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go um, but there were a few standouts uh, Taylor Adams kept up his great form for GWS yes. uh, Trelaw had another great game um, Bartell and that kept were kept pretty quiet Selwood until the last quarter was kept quite quiet um, Tom Hawkins didn't do much. I mean, GWS didn't play a bad game by any sorts. I mean, they obviously just tired out at three-quarter time, and that was the big difference. And talking about key forwards, how good is Jeremy Cameron? <laughs> <laughs> I want him in my team. <laughs> <laughs> Trade I, think, I think everybody could do with a Jerry Cameron. Oh. You know, the way... It was his third or fourth goal, the one where he, you know, he kept running. Outran so- so- everyone. <laughs> out- outran everyone, socketed to the boundary, you know, just ran around. I can't remember who it was, but, you know, he s- snapped it around the corner and kicked, kicked that goal and just made it look easy. <laughs> this, is, this is a 20-year-old. I, you know, I, this hasn't really been done much. You know, I think Darling and Franklin are the two comparable, mm-hmm. you know, 20-year-old forwards who are kicking... Maybe Wayne Carey. Mm. Yeah. Well, and ho- of, of, you know, this millennium at least, you know, and go back to Wayne Carey and probably Chris Grant as well who are taking it, you know, so early. And Jeremy Cameron's just, you know, fantastic to watch. You know, he probably hasn't got, you know, the size yet to compete with, you know, guerrilla forwards, and yet he's still, sorry, guerrilla defenders, and he's still, you know, taking brilliant pack marks, and, you know, he's outrunning defenders as well, and he's going to be a fantastically good player if he isn't already. And hypothetically, imagine if Buddy did go to G- uh, GWS. Imagine Cameron being the third forward, getting the third tall each week. You'd say Patton's number two? Yeah, like uh, no, fully I, fit. No, Cam- fully Cameron's fit. number two. Patton's stronger. That's the thing. I think Patton will get the strong... Because the sec- two, key, two key defenders are usually strong, muscly type people mm-hmm. where I think he'll get the third tall because he's not that strong one-on-one. He just sprints out and gets the third kind of... Um, leading Mark, so I think he'd be more capable for a third tall. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, we're just going to go to some SIM messages now. Be sure to keep on texting in your thoughts on 0427 767 767 or online at sin.org.au. Uh, we're going to come back with some coach ratings as well as the Melbourne situation, and we'll log you out of Facebook, Luke. <laughs> this is another Sports Desk host profile. Y'all ready for this? Thursday. Name? Jonathan Moore. Favourite sports? Basketball, football, hockey, basketball, any sport. Favourite sporting memory? Um, what when Hawthorne won the grand final? What else are you going to say? When Hawthorne won the grand final against the Long. What's going to be the biggest sports story coming out of this year? Derek Rose coming back at the playoffs and Chicago winning the playoffs. What up? What's something about you that no one knows about? I'm actually a really gifted basketball player and I double up as a player in the NBL. I shouldn't tell you who uh, has absolutely dominated over the last season for the Melbourne Tigers. I'm not going to drop names, but you, you can figure it out. You can catch the Sports Desk daily from 9am on Neon Sin. Call Rosa Dactyl. Calling Rosa Dactyl Mobile. Yo, Rose, where you at? Yo, Till, I'm over here. I'm in. Let the beat drop. Tuesdays, 90.7 Sin Radio. Oh, and you're back listening to Bound for Glory on Sin. Magnificent timing there, Joyce. Thanks for the heads up. I said... 
<laughs> anyway, coach situation. How how are we doing? How are we doing? All right, we'll start from the top of the ladder and we'll work our way down because obviously we're not going to have much to say about those on top of the ladder. Okay, Chris Scott, so, this season, any issues? He's pretty no. safe, I'd say. We're looking, we're looking to sack everyone. We just want a bit of feedback. Anything? Anything to say on Chris Scott? Anything worth? Uh, no, 10, 10, 10, 10 would yeah. coach again. Yeah, 10, yeah. 10, 10, yeah. 10, 10 would coach again. Uh, one thing, shut up, Aiden. Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> Again, in the second half, it, the show always devolves into farce. Okay, Alistair Clarkson. Well, according to Jeff Kennedy, he should be gone by now. <laughs> he was going to get sacked. Right just now. second on the ladder. Yeah, just casually. Not yeah, nine and one, no worries. Nah. Let's just sack the coach. Probably, no, nah, we shouldn't have any pressure on him, but I don't think he's been a, as good as Chris Scott. Okay, John Longmire. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, great. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, Horse the for Premier. Yeah. Mm. Uh, James Hurd. He is not the coach. <laughs> How many times has the camera panned yeah. to him and he's just been hand looking, on his face. looking? Maybe he's playing Facebook and games or something. No, yeah. maybe. Yeah. And Bomber Thompson was the one up in the commentary box, yeah. uh, not the commentary box, the coach's box, actually coaching. And James Hurd was on the boundary going, Good job, boys. <laughs> That's all he does. He's a figurehead and he barracks for the team. 30 steps to coaching by James Hurd. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube that if you have YouTube seen it. 30, uh, what is it? 30 steps, 30 to, steps to coaching. By James Heard. Oh. Nonetheless, I think we might let Asada sort that one out. <laughs> yeah. Well, in fairness, aside aside from that, I think the uh, coaching panel's done a good job. So obviously, they have done with it. that Can, with that pressure on him, uh, yeah. Yeah. Cons- well. Considering Essendon sort of structured yeah. different to everyone else yeah. with that, obviously he was joint probably thing. in danger at the start, but he's mm. he's really bounced back and done yeah. well. So very very Ross Lyon. So. Ross Lyon, uh, probably my coach for the year so far. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't have Unfortunately. Clarkson ahead of him, honestly. No. no neither. Uh, who, who have Cawthorn lost to? Geelong in round one. That's it. And they've played the other top eight from I'll, last I'll, year. When you I'll look put that the, down to personnel. Yeah, I'll put that down the list. When you look at Fremantle, with all the outs that they've had, they only play four finalists from 2012 for the rest of the season, and two of them, Adelaide and North Melbourne, are at home. They're going to finish top four, possibly top two. Mm. But, sorry, back to Hawthorne. Sorry to go on that with the rant, but the... Ability to make up for suckling being out that, for the whole thing, yeah, that, that's and Sean makers. Oh, and Frio, you know, they've got Pavlich, Pavlich and Sandlin's Sandlin's Rock Riff, and yeah. Yeah. oh no, yeah. Sandlin's they've I've, I've Zach Dawson's rucking. That's the situation yeah. over in Perth. It's been, winning. It's still, it's been shown. Dawson it's winning, been so. shown that Sandlin's is act, like they actually perform worse when Sandlin's in the team. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I don't think Sandlin's is as good as good a ruckman as he's the, the amount of hit yeah. outs. That he one year he was. Know, he, but that's know, he, he, he taps it down, but not necessarily to you know See, the midfielders' advantage. Ross Lyons. Ross, Ross Lyons. One of those player like coaches that it's like I can't stand you, but damn, do I respect you? Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying yeah. Lyons a bad coach. He's still my top three, but I think Clarkson's number one in my opinion. Mick Malthouse. Safe. I think he's. I, I think the win loss record flatters him. I don't think he's been that good. I think he's made a lot of changes, which are, you know you can respect that. But uh, the output hasn't been good enough. I, th- I think yeah, you're right. The output's not good enough. But I think they'll pay off down the line. We've got to move through these quicker. Um, Nathan Buckley, no pressure. No, no, no pressure. Man, no pressure. Uh, John Morsfold, gone, mm. gone at the end of the year. It depends on it depends on if um, West Coast make finals. I think. Yep, they won't. And you missed Hardwick as well. No, we said Hardwick. No, we? No, 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 we didn't. Okay, Hardwick. Oh, some pressure. No. Oh, he's not make much. finals. He's, he's, he's safe. Finals, he's, he's safe. He's safe. He's he's safe. safe. He's Even if he doesn't make finals, yeah. I think it's oh, natural no, progression. If we don't make the finals th- at this point, I think it's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> I think he'd be under less pressure than Nathan Buckley would. Mm. Okay. Brendan Sanderson. So it's one week. He's, yeah. He's, yeah. he's safe, but I don't think the Crows have been as good as they should have. Next year might be a few. Ken Hinckley. Oh, yes. He's safe. Uh, Guy McKenna? Yeah, so very safe. safe. Brad Scott? Yeah, a little well, bit more. <laughs> even if he's not, you have to pay out three years. Yeah. So. Yeah, so, yeah, saved safe. by his four-year contract, mm, yeah. I think, at the yeah. moment, rather than his coaching output. Uh, I can't think of the Bulldogs coach off my head. McCartney. Yeah, McCartney yeah, that's, I think he's safe. He's I always safe. Th- I think teacher. That's like the word association <laughs> game I played, teacher. McCartney, okay. Um, yeah, Brisbane. He, oh, just, oh, oh, one sorry. quickly on McCartney. McCartney. Um, yeah, he's got them... They'll play different football every year, so they're basically all defensive now and no offense, um, and that'll just slowly get better. So yeah. you can you can see where they're going. Yeah, so he's, very he's safe. safe. Uh, Michael Voss. Now we're getting warmer. Gone. Yeah. Now we're going. Oh, I was on the Sack Voss bandwagon last week, and I'm still on it. So <laughs> I'm sucking everyone. <laughs> uh, okay. Next. Uh, what is? What is? Nah, he's got a shit list. 
Can't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> Just casually, Next. 10 a.m. drop an S word, Pete. Yeah. This is a hardcore <laughs> radio <laughs> station. Happy yeah. juice over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he's. He's doing the best with what he has. If only he would play Josh Saunders, I would be happy. But <laughs> that, that's a fantasy footy perspective, though, isn't it? Uh, he's, he's, pl- he's playing as much youth as he can, given what Ross Lyon left behind him, so he, he's doing well in that regard. And, you know, St Kilda will be a good team. If he and Leon so. Cameron? Leon Cameron. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll go JWS first, because then it'll lead us in our next one. Leon Cameron. Yes. Leon Cameron, Kevin Sheedy, that yeah, again, it's, it's the Leon. weird Essendon well, dynamic. That Sheedy's going. not safe because he's gone next yeah. year yeah, from Cameron, so I think that Ka- Cameron's got a lot to work with. Yep, yeah. a lot to work with. So this, that leaves us to our last team, Melbourne, and, and segue. Oh, clearly safe. Mark <laughs> Neal. Uh, I don't think there's much you can say. I think we should just break it down first. Okay, the coaching, w- what needs to happen, and potentially if the decision is removing Mark Neald, who needs to come in. Obviously, they probably can't get someone right away, but obviously Todd Viney will probably take over for the rest of the year if they decide to get rid of him. Who comes in next year? Rawlings was OK at Richmond, I thought, when he, he was a caretaker. caretaker. Yeah, he was OK. He got Delidio to actually play some decent football when he was off the boiler a bit. Um, so maybe you can do that. I, I don't think the Melbourne players are as bad as they are showing. They're just not putting in the effort because they don't believe in the coach. And or the game plan or the structure. Yeah, so, and, and it was just due to Neil having that real hard ass attitude when he really started um, as the coach, and they've never really bought in after that. Where after he was, there was too much tough love and not enough, you know. Love. Hard, love, love. <laughs> love, love. <laughs> yeah. Happy juice. Some from, oh, some from left field. <laughs> Um, Brett Radden, I think he's a Hawthorne now. Uh, I'm not sure if he'll go to the D's. Um, Matty Primus, I think he, you know, I think he did a decent job with Port. I think he's probably worthy of a senior gig again. No. Um, not so much Primus. Matty Knights, maybe. He was a great mm. development coach at Essendon. Not so much, you know, a game day coach, mm. but um, as a development coach, I, I at where as Melbourne's list is at. Sure, why not? Um, Radden was, I believe, midfield coach at Melbourne for one year. That was many years ago before he stepped into Carlton, and he was fantastic. So, you know, Melbourne have got a very good midfield, but, you you know, they can do a lot more. You know, there's there's players there, you know, players like Jack Grimes and Colin Sylvie, I think they have capability to be much better midfielders than, you know, flankers, half-back, half-forward. You know, I think there's a lot to work with, and he can do a good job. Personally, I bring in some um, really tough coach like even if they're past their prime not permanently but just to shake things up like you know i know lee matthews wouldn't do it but someone like a lee matthews you're right that someone needs to come in that's experienced but i don't think you're right because look what happened neil came in to shake things up Mm. and he's obviously gone too far with things have been shaken up things have been shaken up yeah but we're talking like someone who's actually had experience look i've done this premiership you know premiership coach like hell you know you could probably go down and get tommy (laughs) hafey down there and ron (laughs) brassi is still alive on our text line 0427 767 i was going to mention tom uh tom hafey and ron brassi come down for the rest of the year bring back they would they would shake (laughs) okay i think that's pushing it a bit but uh, but yeah ron ron brassi tom hafey bring them in they can they can co-coach till the end of the year and i'll you, by the end of the year, they'd be either leaving the AFL or they'd be a half decent side. Mm. I, I still think like, the greatest idea for satire that I've probably ever come up with, with my own head. You know, it's nicking a bit off John Saf- John Saffron too. When the Socceroos couldn't qualify for the World Cup, they went and um, found a witch doctor to take the curse off one of the players that was apparently put on him about thirty years ago. I think we need to perform some sort of exorcism or some sort of um, communication with... Let your demon out. <laughs> Norm, Norm, Norm Smith on the other side of the veil. I think we need to... I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not stuffing around. This is something that needs to be considered because this is too irregular for, like, common sense. But too, this many bad things can't happen. We, 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 we have a panel face palming. I'm sorry. Like, this is like... And I thought my idea was crazy. I'm crazy. telling you, like it will work. It will that. work. Talking about we need to put this on the demo. <laughs> right, of course, Jeff Kennett, what, will he make the club better if he does come in? No. 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 Melbourne. No. Melbourne. <laughs> Melbourne, this is my open message to you and all you Melbourne supporters listening. If you do listen to us, I'm not sure you do. Ethan anyway, e- you do. Ethan does. <laughs> He's here. Oh, sometimes. Do not, <laughs> do not put Jeff Kennett in ch- President Melbourne. He's already said in numerous interviews that... Relocation and mergers should be discussed. 
No, no, mm. don't. don't. Mm. Like, I'm, I'm telling you now, don't. No, no. So if Stop that, thinking about it. No. So if it was too long, don't listen. Don't bring in Kennett. Bring in a guy that's been dead for decades. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that's too long. He didn't he's, he's, he's twice proposed mergers for Melbourne, you know, with Hawthorne and with North. He hasn't. Mm. I, I think you've mentioned it before, but he hasn't retracted either of those statements. So he thinks it legitimately, legitimately thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> Which, from it's a business, not, from a business sense, might be an okay or has a potential to work. But from a football club, you know, in a football environment and supporters that give, there's a lot of supporters that haven't seen anything from that football club for fifty odd years. They made a grand final thirteen years ago. Mm. Since then, not much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what you just merge the team on them? Yeah, they've, they've invested that much of their own money. They've invested that much of their own. Um, you know, uh, time, time, <laughs> just a lot of time, fair bit, emotions, uh, emotions, <laughs> all the emotions on the mostly negative emotions. But what about Nathan Bassett in the sand floor? He's mm. constantly credited as being a great coach, um, as well as developing some some great players. That could come in as a fair idea. coach. Yeah, like, I, I think the issue is he would only want to be a head coach. Like he was, he wouldn't take an assistant coaching role at AFL oh, level. But God. if a head coach thing popped up. Why not? I don't think you should necessarily go from a reserves head coach to straight to an AFL head coach. I think next step would be, you know, assistant coaching. I don't think you make such <laughs> such a big leap in such a short time. Well, probably about the same quality. Just put that out there. <laughs> 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 All right, we've degenerated again. Oh, We're going to go quickly to some Second, we're like North Melbourne. Some sin messages and then come back to the two previews <laughs> for the rest of the weekend. Objection, 5 to 6 p.m. weekdays and 8 to 10 a.m. weekends. Hi, I'm Shreyas, and I once tripped over a blind man's walking stick. Objection on Sin. Sin's international feature album of the week, The National, Trouble Will Find Me. All that breaks behind the houses. I don't see what's strange about this. US Faves, The National, released their sixth studio album ahead of their headlining spot at Splendor in the Grass. It's still dark and brooding, yet strangely uplifting. Listen to the international feature album, The National, Trouble Will Find Me, all this week on Zoom. That's a sheep. This is Sin. You're on Bound for Glory on Sin. Text us in on 0427-767-767. Thankfully, there are no sheep in the studio. <laughs> That's a sheep and we're Bound for Glory. <laughs> oh, preview. Today, we only have one game today. It's uh, St Kilda West Coast and it's in Melbourne. So, yeah. I think this should be relatively... Uh, straightforward St Kilda obviously. Oh I wouldn't jump to that yeah. Really? This no. weekend I wouldn't jump to any conclusions <laughs> It's a bizarro world No West, West Coast will be up by 30 points You know halfway through the first quarter We'll be like yeah we can take the foot off the pedal And St Kilda will win Something mm. like that Probably <laughs> Well so you similar to a game last night Yeah <laughs> essentially A certain game that <laughs> A certain unmentioned night. <laughs> certain, yeah. certain game that we won't discuss ever again and I think that We'll burn from the records Carlton were up by five goals Mm -hmm. GWS yeah. were up by five goals. North were up, North by, five. Were up by five. So don't do get in get front. Up by five. <laughs> do not. <laughs> Unless there's two minutes left. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I don't. Uh, I don't know. It's a long time they run well, didn't they? You know who I think is going to be the match winner for St Kilda West Coast? The late in Josh Saunders. He's going to. Do it. <laughs> He's going Again, to be the one. Stop it. The, <laughs> the fantasy. There is. You have issues. There is, no. There is no potential. <laughs> um, but surely West Coast would be breathing fire after last week because they were quite pitiful um, against Richmond. The tackling and general pressure around the ground wasn't good enough. Um, St Kilda, they've got this massive split between extremely young and old and decrepit. Um, <laughs> and, and they're too slow on one end with the old people and they're too they don't have a tank with the young people so you've really got like Armitage and Stephen and that's, that's about they're, it they're in a phase in which it's not only weeding out who should be there in a couple of years time where they're not going to get consistency they're going to have up good weeks and they're going to have bad weeks and I think it's going to annoy fans but I think it's just something I think a lot of them have accepted so uh, they're in a difficult phase at the moment. From a West Coast point of view, I think somebody who's come in and you know been fantastic after his injury, Nick Natanui, I think 
Oh, get out of this with his Saunders business. I'm <laughs> sick of it. He's, he's, he's drawing Sanders on the piece of paper. Saunders. He's, 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 he's his name right. He's no... <laughs> hang on. Firstly... Colonel Saunders. <laughs> at, at this stage, he's been absolutely no good. I think the Saints have come in and brought in a, a few decent players in Murdoch and, and whatnot. But going back to Nick Nadanu, he's been phenomenal. And I think that... If we if we go back and had a, had the time again, if he like I thought throughout the year of the 2008 draft that Nadanui was certain to go number one, then late in the year what's but he sprung up. I think, yeah, Dees would be regretting that. Do you think the Dees could have developed Nick Nat the way the West Coast have? Yeah. Because no. West Coast development's been fantastic. He'd be hanging around the development league in the VFL. Oh, for him. <laughs> wouldn't that be a Casey shame? Casey seconds. I think of that so many times. Like, what if blank uh, X player was drafted to X club, like Franklin to Richmond, when we had no development? We would have been robbed of Buddy Franklin, and that's not a good thing. Yeah, yeah. You were still robbed, robbed of Buddy Franklin. Yeah. Franklin. Yeah. You know, like, like, the league would have been robbed of Buddy yes, Franklin. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and I same think, with Nick Nat to Melbourne. I, I, imagine if Jack Watts was in a different club. He yeah. could have been a superstar. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think we should no, I think we get should, on top. <laughs> we, you're right. That, that you've drifted again. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we need to tie you to a leash or something. <laughs> you're drifting. <laughs> get back. Okay, hold on. Okay. The outs for West Coast today, Darren Glass not playing. Mark Lacra hurt his arm and Hutchings out. But... They, only they shouldn't in, have dropped Hutchings. He was only, good enough. They only bring in Hams, Brennan and Wilson. They're obviously not... They, yeah, they, they haven't they're brought not, Brown back in. in. They bring haven't in, brought Brown back in. You've got the eye poke, that's why. Mm. The, in, yeah, uh, you got, you got pokes in the eye. Oh, well. oh, he might still be playing, actually. Is he? Is he? Uh, anyway, no, maybe. I can't see him. Well, maybe. that's the Melbourne and Collingwood game for yeah, starters. So he <laughs> might <laughs> Right, he's not. at centre-half back on Rewalt. <laughs> Ta- talking about... Far, this show falls apart <laughs> towards well, the end. None, nonetheless, I think we should actually talk about the game for a starter. If St Kilda can attack the footy enough, I know they've got their very low tackle count this year. I don't think they're very good contested side. If they can match West Coast, you know, they can run around the outside. I think you know they can control the game, much like they did against Carlton. They can win, but I think for the sake of it, West Coast is a better team. I think we're going to have to tip them. Yep, West Coast. Yep, uh, Eagles. Yep, Eagles. Yeah, Eagles. I can't see St Kilda pulling off an upset as as much as probably a, a lot of people would like to think, but mm, no, I can't see them competitive. Uh, considering last week, I can't see them stay competitive with a side that is incredibly good and is incredibly tall up forward, and they can get a lot of ball because they've got a very good midfield. Tomorrow, Queen's birthday clash. Woo! <laughs> I, I want to create some controversy before we talk through this. Yeah. Should Melbourne and Collingwood keep playing on Queen's birthday? Yes. Yes, yeah. it's tradition. Well, it's how they get all their money. It's most of their intake. Yeah, Collingwood give Melbourne the home yeah, game every year, reason. don't they? 